Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, if you were ever asked uh, how many, you know, could you name 10 books in the Bible or memorize 10 Bible verses? Uh, could you do it? You know, uh, I've talked to people and they say, oh yeah, I'm a believer and yeah, I read the Bible. And you say, well, can you name 10 books in the Bible? Uh, some people can't even do that. I mean, if you can't even name 10 books in the Bible, how can you say you've read them? I mean, really think about it. But I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Um, there is two really, really short verses in the Bible. One, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Now, why did Jesus weep? Oh, well, because everybody thought he wept because Lazarus had died. Now... No, he wept because of their unbelief. I mean, this is the guy that restored sight to the blind and had the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak. Uh, the lame were able to walk. He healed people of all kinds of things and fed people with, you know, a few barley loaves and some fishes and fed thousands. And then they were wondering, why, why, why is he so worried? You know, why is he weeping? Why is Jesus weeping? He's weeping because they didn't understand that he could even raise those from the dead. Yes. Jesus wept because of their unbelief. The second shortest verse in the Bible is what our topic is today. And it's on, remember Lot's wife. All right, so remember Lot's wife. Who was Lot? Well, let's do a little background here. Lot was a nephew of Abraham. So let's take a look at the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 13. Generally, 13 is not a good number in the Bible. Generally, it's Generally, on 13, bad things happen. You know, there was 12 tribes of Israel, right? Actually, sort of, kind of, you could argue there was 13, because uh, Joseph had Ephraim and Manasseh. So, I don't know, but they're both under Joseph. So, yeah. All right, Genesis 13. We're going to skip around a little bit because this is about Lot's wife, not Lot. Verse 1. And Abram, now this is before Abram's name was changed by the Lord to Abraham. Abraham means father of many nations. And your demon nominational churches will try to con convince you that uh, one little nation over there in the Middle East is many. No. Last time I checked, one is not many. One is one, and many is many. But, hey, what do I know? You know, you got, they got doctor degrees and PhDs. Um, I had somebody once told me, you know, you go to college for four years, and you get a BS degree, Bachelor of Science or Bible Studies, you know, BS. And then you go two more years, you get a master's, 
and you get an MS, which is more of the same. And then you go for two more years and you get a PhD, which means piled higher and deeper of the same BS. But, you know, what can I tell you? And uh, the way colleges are today, uh, yeah, that's pretty much true. So, and Abram went up out of Egypt. He and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. In the Bible, wealth was defined by land, cattle, silver, and gold. That's wealth. What do we have in the West today? Uh... In the United States, up until 1933, we had gold coins, believe it or not. $20 gold pieces. Yeah. It was like 90% uh, gold, one ounce coin, $20. Yeah. And you could have bought a, a Model T, I think, for about $500. So for about $25... Um, 25, yeah, 25 gold coins, you could have bought a brand new car. Silver. Up until 1964, we had silver coins in the United States. A uh, silver dime would have bought two candy bars at 7-Eleven, the most expensive place to buy a candy bar. I know because I bought many candy bar at that place. And cattle. Well, cattle is no good unless you have land for them to uh, eat the grass. So, so in the United States, uh, we have no gold. We have no silver. Uh, farm animals are not allowed in the city, for the most part. And do you own property? Uh, even if you don't have a mortgage with the bank, uh, no, you don't. You don't own squat and if you don't believe me, quit paying your property taxes for a couple of years. And uh, the sh county sheriff will come and show you exactly who owns that property. Yeah, yeah, you, you're renting it from the county or the state or whatever. That's all you're doing. And if there was ever a depression and you didn't have any money, well, you don't own it. Um, during the Depression of 1929, the uh, Rockefeller family bought up city blocks of New York City for back taxes during the Depression. Matter of fact, the United Nations building sits on some of the land that that family donated to build the United Nations, the One World Government. In New York City. I think it was six square city blocks. Uh, he wasn't just an oil baron. He was also in banking. So, yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, how come I know all this stuff? Oh, that's right. I don't watch television very often. Yeah. You know what? Uh, one of, you know, they were, uh, Paul was being interrogated by some uh, the kings, or, well, maybe not kings, but some of the rulers, he was accused of heresy, and I think it was Felix, and he told Paul that much learning doth make you mad. Paul, you're beside yourself. You're crazy. All this learning is making you insane. I think I kind of sort of understand, so. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel. Beth means house, and El has a contraction for God. House of the Lord, Bethel, house of God. Unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. 
unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. From what I understand, it takes about uh, 10 acres to uh, graze one to two cows or cattle. So if you've got dozens of cattle, you better have a lot of land. Verse 7. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. So I guess Abram's uh, workers and Lot's workers, their cattlemen, you know, there's just not enough land between the, you know, for all the these great flocks and herds. And... Uh, and you got the Canaanites in the land. So there's a reason that's in there. I'm not sure why, totally. Maybe the Canaanites made problems. I don't know. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. You know, let's not have our people fight amongst ourselves. Verse 9 is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. And if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if thou wilt depart to the right, then I will go to the left. Abram's being very gracious here. He's telling him, look, you go one way and I'll go the other. You, you pick first. Wow. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zoar. So evidently, Sodom and Gomorrah, that area, that land, was well watered. Now, if you got water, you're going to have lots of trees and lots of grass. And it was compared even to the Garden of the Lord, like the Garden of Eden, and like the land of Egypt. Um, I don't know if you people know it, but Egypt was a major world power at one time because of the Nile River. The Nile River would uh, flood every year, and they built dikes with irrigation canals and when it would overflow all the water would you know they built reservoirs and what have you and as long as you got water you can grow food that's the way it is especially in the desert egypt was uh the nile river it turned egypt into a uh, agricultural power well guess what Egypt grows excellent cotton and excellent wheat, even to this day. And uh, because of this, a lot of world powers wanted to conquer Egypt. Uh, one being Rome. So, you ever heard of Anthony and Cleopatra? Yeah. Anthony was a Roman general. And Cleopatra was ruler of Greece, but she was not Egyptian. She was a Greek, believe it or not. Cleopatra was a Greek because um, this was after the time when uh, Alexander the Great, they call him the Macedonian, but hey, he spoke Greek and Macedonia is like neighbors to Greece, you know. So Cleopatra was very possibly blonde-haired and blue-eyed. Who knows? I don't know. She was supposed to be a very beautiful woman. And uh, Rome wanted Egypt because of all the wheat. 
Verse 11, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Remember the Jordan River? Oh, yeah. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Verse 13. Genesis 13, 13. Listen to this. I told you 13 is a bad number, right? Genesis 13, 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. <laughs> Ooh, boy. What did Jed Clampett used to say? Ooh, doggy. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You know, people, I honestly think the Lord's hand was on the uh, numbering of chapters and verses in the Bible. I'm strongly convinced of that. There's just certain numbers just end up coming up and good, not good. So, oh, I thought uh, Lot was actually Abram's brother, according to uh, Genesis 14, 16. It says his brother, Lot. Now, here's an interesting verse, Genesis 15 and verse 6, concerning Abram. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, counted it to him, Abram, for righteousness. So believing in the Lord is counted for righteousness. There you go. Now, in Genesis 18, and the um, some angels came to meet Abram. Well, Abraham, he had had his name changed by the Lord. So let's look at Genesis 18, 16. And the men, the angels, rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, so this is the angel of the Lord. Uh, the angel of the Lord is, my opinion and many other people, Jesus in before he was in the flesh. He's called the angel of the Lord. He's called the Lord at times, and he speaks for the Lord in the first person. No angel would do that. Uh, there, I think I did an, well, I, I'm pretty sure I did an entire study on that, if anybody's interested. So, verse 17, and the Lord said, all right, so these angels are getting ready to go to Sodom. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham Ham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, 
Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? You know, are you going to wipe out the whole city, everybody? Even if there's righteous people in the city? That's the Bob paraphrase. 24. Peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. So fifty were good. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon myself to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. And, you know, you think about it. What is our bodies at the end of life? Dust and ashes, right? Peradventure, they shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. Okay. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall be thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. Hmm. Okay, we're getting down there, huh? And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet this once. This is the last time, Lord. Okay? This is it. That's the Bob translation. Peradventure 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. You know, when there's not 10 righteous people in a city look out and there's going to come a time people when the wicked are going to drive the righteous out they will drive them out of the cities trust me to save their lives the righteous will have to leave verse 33 and the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abram, Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. When there's, only, when there's only 10 people in a city, make sure you're not number nine. That's all I can tell you. Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. When there's not 10 righteous in that city, look out. Look out, baby. Fire and brimstone. I'm not really a fire and brimstone kind of preach uh, teacher, but hey. All right. Genesis chapter 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. So here it is. These two angels are, went to Sodom at the evening. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Oh, we appreciate your offer and your hospitality, but we're gonna we're just gonna sleep out in the you know outside. Verse three, and he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Um, unleavened bread is basically like crackers saltine crackers you know flatbread um it's uh it you know 
when you uh, have bread and you want it to rise, you have to give it time. But if you want to eat quickly, you make what's called unleavened bread. Verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round. So they surrounded the house, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Um, if you got young children listening to this, uh, you might want to pause or send them out of the room or whatever. You know? Uh, they want to know them carnally. They don't want to shake their hand and introduce them. No, no, no. Uh, in other words, they want fresh meat. Yeah. Verse 6. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. And I said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and ye and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. In other words, uh, hey, these guys are under my protection. You know, it's called hospitality. And God forbid we would ever offer our virgin daughters to a bunch of residents of Sodom. Personally, I'd like to give them a, uh, an enema with uh, a 12, you know, gauge. Yeah, yeah. Personally, I'd like to give them an enema. But uh, hey, that's just me, you know. So what was these guys' answer? And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs to be a judge. Oh, this guy comes and, and wants to, you know, live with us, but but he's judging us. He, he thinks he's in charge here. So they say, now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men, the angels, but the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness. Do you know what? There's been uh, at least one other time that angel or angels of the Lord smote an army of Assyrians with blindness. I think it was a day with Elisha, E-L-I-S-H-A. Yeah. Smote them with blindness. Well, they're spiritually blind. So they made them physically blind as well. Can you imagine that? Here it is. These guys want to rape these angels. And um, they're struck with blindness. And, you know, if there's like a couple dozen of these guys and they're all blind and they're all saying, oh, I'm blind, I'm blind. Yeah, me too, me too. Oh, I'm blind too, me too. We're all blind. You think that would stick in their minds? You think they'd get on their hands and knees and repent and say, Lord, forgive me. No. No. Absolutely nothing in the Bible about that. Zero. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house of blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, 
the angels. Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place. So evidently, he's got at least, what, uh, two virgin daughters and some married daughters, right? Verse 13. Here we go, verse uh, 13 again. The angels are speaking here. For we will destroy this place. Woo! For we will destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Yeah, you want to celebrate LBGT? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The Lord's getting ready to celebrate LBGT right here. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters. So there's at least two. Maybe three, four, five, I don't know. And said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Yeah, you know, they're they're like, ah, yeah, don't listen to this old fool. He's crazy. The Lord's going to destroy this city. Man, get out of here, crazy, crazy father-in-law. Verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hast hastened Lot, saying, Arise, Take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So the married daughters, they don't want to leave. They're going to listen to their husbands. They like this place. But the two virgin daughters, well, okay. So take your wife, your daughters, pack up and get the heck out of Dodge. We're going to wipe this place off the face of the earth. And people, let me tell you something. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Werner Keller. Uh, he wrote a book, The Bible is History. I think it was written in the 50s. He was like an archaeologist. He was a German archaeologist. He um, was digging around the desert near the Dead Sea. And he discovered a layer of glass in the sand a layer of glass how do you make glass oh you take sand and you melt it very very high temperature melt it um you cannot melt sand with an open air fire sand it just doesn't get hot enough wood will not get hot enough you got to have what's called a blast furnace you got to have a an enclosed area and feed oxygen and concentrate the heat from, you know, wood or whatever. Uh, coal burns hotter than wood, but, you know, you're not going to have coal out in the middle of the desert, right? So they're theorizing that Sodom and Gomorrah were near the Dead Sea, which is probably why it's dead. And uh, when God rained down fire and brimstone, it melted the sand in the glass and you know they never saw that again until they did the atomic testing in the desert in uh i think the sands of nevada out in the desert of nevada when they did the uh what was it the trinity atomic testing of world war ii i think around 44 45 or whatever they saw sa uh, sand melted in the glass yeah Yep, let's celebrate LBGT. Let's celebrate it. Hey, look at all this pretty glass. Oh, yeah. So, arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, he's hanging out. The men grabbed hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. 
the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So here it is, these two angels. They grab Lot's hand, his wife's hand, and the other one grabbed, well, I don't know which, you know, I don't know which angel grabbed what, but one angel's hand grabbed Lot, another, uh, another hand grabbed the wife, another hand grabbed one daughter, and the other hand grabbed another daughter and pulled them out of the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. People, there is a modern day, modern day application to this verse. When there are no, not 10 righteous people in a city, escape for thy life. Get the heck out of Sodom. Get the heck out of Gomorrah. Get the heck out of Mystery Babylon. Lest thou be consumed with them. The Lord said, Come out of her, my people. Speaking of Mystery Babylon, Come out of her, my people. Lest thou be her... Well, let me read it. And that, everybody, is in Revelation 18.4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of Mystery Babylon. Come out of Sodom. Come out of Gomorrah. Come out of Egypt. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Yeah, come out of her, my people. Is there a modern day application of this? Yes. Genesis 19, 17. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, the angel, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Look not behind thee. Remember that. Look not behind thee. Don't look back. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest thou be consumed. So in Genesis, they were told, don't, don't look back, don't hang out in the plains, but go to the mountains. Go to the mountains. Do you know Jesus warned about in Matthew 24, one of the end time verses? Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel, now this is Christ speaking, not Bob. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. What's the abomination of de uh, de desolation? Standing in the holy place? Well, what's the holy place? The temple? Jerusalem? Something along those lines. It's kind of open for interpretation, but uh, when you see the abomination of desolation, you'll know. When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Verse 16, Then let him, then let them, which be in Judea, flee to the mountains. You know what, people? In 70 AD, the Jews were revolting against Rome. They had their little messianic fe uh, fever. Oh, the Messiah is going to come and throw off Rome. They're a yoke of Rome. 
And uh, General Titus had a legion, which is like an army division, you know. And had surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And all the Christians were trapped inside, along with the Jews. Well, then, Titus pulled his armies back. And the Christians that believed this fled. They, they left. They fled to the mountains. Now, there is a, uh, the, the verse exactly I'm talking about is in Luke 21, verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed, you know, encompassed, surrounded, compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereunto. So the Christians that believe Jesus and knew the scriptures, when they saw the Roman army surround Jerusalem, they were like, oh, we're in trouble. But then General Titus pulled back his armies. He didn't engage. He left a gap so that everybody could that wanted to leave could. Why did he do this? Well, simple. There were reinforcements coming. There was another legion coming. And uh, Titus didn't want to attack with half of an army because he had had they had had problems and they had taken casualties. So it's always better to attack with your full force at one time. And yeah, I was in the army, but I'm not an expert, but hey. So General Titus pulled back and didn't engage. And the Christians that believed Jesus fled to the mountains. Well, guess what? The reinforcements came. Titus merged the two legions. And then they attacked Jerusalem. And they totally destroyed Jerusalem. Totally destroyed it. And destroyed the temple. And you know what the abomination of desolation was, in my opinion? Animal sacrifices. Yeah. The animal sacrifices that they were doing after Jesus died on the cross for our sins, in my opinion, is the abomination of desolation. Because it's an utter, total, complete denial of what Jesus did on the cross. It's a denial and 70 AD, God the Father, via the Romans, showed the you-know-whos, what he thought of their little uh, temple animal sacrifices. Oh, so the death of my son's not good enough for you, huh? Okay, let me show you something. Matthew 24, 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever... Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, this might happen again, people. This might be a double, uh, double prophecy. Happened in 70 AD. Might happen again in our lifetime. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it is. So they're told, when you see Judea surrounded, flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the rooftop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. When you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, fly to the mountains. Boom. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then... 
shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Miracles, people. Insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Now, I've done an entire thing on Matthew 24. You want to do a series on Matthew 24? I got playlist on it. Like a couple hours. Verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Now they're talking about the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, when the Lord comes, it's going to be like lightning lighting up the, from the east to the west. It's going to light up the whole sky. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Ain't going to be no secret rapture when everybody's going to see him coming. It ain't got nothing secret about it. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. To the mountains, people. Back to Genesis 19. So the angels grab Lot, his wife, and the two daughters by the hands and drag them out of the city. Now remember, Lot's got a house. Lot's got cattle. You know, Lot's probably pretty wealthy. You know, maybe not as wealthy as Abraham, but Abraham, he, but he's got money. You know, he's got cattle and a house and, you know, Verse 17, and it came to pass, Genesis 19, 17, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now, Thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and hast and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow the city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither. You know, make haste, get out of here, quick. For I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. And the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. I think I'm going to make this a part two. I really do. I think I should do that. Because we're now we're going to get into the important stuff. Okay. So this will be 
part one of Remember Lot's Wife. I laid down the foundation, and then we're going to do the punchline. Uh, thank you, everybody, for all your prayers for the hands. Oh, I'm feeling much better. I mean, if my hand would have hurt like that for the rest of my life, I would have been crippled. I mean, seriously, it hurt bad. And, uh, you know, I'm crazy guy. And I mean, my I'm spending more time in the computer doing ministry stuff than when I had an eight hour a day job, which is nice. I'm not complaining, but I'm just saying I needed my hand. You know, it's what operates the mouse and the typing and Bible research. And yeah, so thank you for your prayers. I'm doing much, much, much better. Um, people, I'm doing all I can for as long as I'm still on the Internet because there's going to be a day when there's not 10 righteous people in a city and they're going to be destroyed. And the wicked are going to drive us out. They're either going to kill us or they're going to drive us into the wilderness. Either way, pray for the best, hope for the best, pray for the best, and prepare for the worst. I guess that's the old Boy Scout in me. Or was that the army? Oh, I forget. Uh, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.